Hi, everybody. How's it going? Welcome uh, to D&D Optimized, part of the D4 network. This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons & Dragons 5e, and we crunch numbers about them, we theorycraft about them, and basically just try to create a character that is both really fun and also really powerful to play in-game. So, if you enjoy creating characters for D&D almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and we are super happy to have you, so thank you for being here. Uh, my name's Colby, and I'll be your host. I have just a couple of announcements really quick before we get started. First off, thank you, thank you, thank you for helping us get to 20,000 subscribers. I am blown away. It's been just a little over a year, and um, I am incredibly grateful to all of you for helping us get there, so thank you. I love you guys. In case you didn't catch it, check out the little announcement that I made uh, yesterday about our upcoming little celebration that we'll have for the 20K event. We haven't recorded it yet due to some uh, some vacations and some time constraints and real-life obligations and things. Look for that to come out in a couple of weeks, but check out the announcement. We had fun with it, um, just kind of talking about what we are going to be doing, uh, which is like a PvP team deathmatch, basically. Uh, picking um, characters that I've chosen, and we split up into teams, and we all pick our characters and things, so check it out there if you want to see a little preview of what is to come. Also, just FYI, I'm going to be gone out of vacation for the next week almost, um, so... I'm not going to be able to like check or reply to comments very much on this video or any others for the next several days, so don't think that I'm ignoring you. I'm just not available and don't I'm not I don't even think I'm going to have internet access. So anyway, um yeah. Okay, let's jump in to the episode. First off, let me know what you think of the new digs. Um I'm trying out recording in a different place today. I'm not sure what the sound quality is going to be like. The visuals I appreciate are a little more Spartan. But for a variety of reasons, I wanted to give it a try. Let me know what you think. Okay, so if I had to guess what the most common comment that I have received on my videos over the last year or so, I would probably guess that it would be one of two things. Either you should totally do ASMR videos. The world of the Forgotten Realms is one of high fantasy, populated by elves, dwarves, halflings, humans, and other folk. In the realms, knights dare the crypts of the fallen dwarf kings of Delzown, seeking glory and treasure. Or, Holy crap, Homelander plays D&D. Apparently, uh, there, is, there is a bit of a likeness between me and uh, Antony Starr. Early on in one of the videos, and I can't remember who it was, so feel free to take credit for this in the comments if you'd like, someone started calling me Critlander as sort of a play on the, on the name, I suppose. And it kind of stuck ever since amongst uh, some friends and especially on the subreddit and things. On the one hand, like, Homelander is this incredibly evil and creepy supervillain, and so the idea makes me a little uncomfortable. But on the other hand, Antony Starr is an incredibly attractive actor, and so I've just decided to take it as a compliment and embrace it for kicks and giggles. Now, a few weeks ago, I did a video on the ultimate Crit Fisher. Check it out there if you have not seen it. The idea behind that video was basically to build a character who crit very, very often, and when they did, had a bunch of ways to like pile on damage uh, to that critical hit. An idea that I have long wanted to explore is this. What if, instead of building a character who tried to get a really high critical hit chance, we built one who had a way to get like guaranteed critical hits? we could mostly ignore in that situation worrying about increasing our crit chance and instead focus on things that just piled a bunch of damage on once we had achieved that guaranteed critical. This character, of course, would not be a crit fisher, 
but a guaranteed crit lander. Yeah, I went there, sorry. <laughs> so that is what we're doing today. I'm not trying to recreate Homelander in D&D, right? But a build that I am calling the crit lander. Now, as far as I know, there are only three ways in Dungeons & Dragons that that a character can get like guaranteed critical hits. One is be an assassin and get surprise on your enemy. We're not doing that today. Two is make an attack against an enemy from five feet away who is paralyzed. And three is make an attack against an enemy from five feet away who is unconscious. So our focus today is going to be on trying to paralyze our enemies and then trying to basically blow them up while they're paralyzed. The tactic is going to lend itself really well to a character and build that's focused on burst or nova damage, uh, which is what this character will be. And the best chassis uh, to make this all happen, I think, is a Sorkadon, a sorcerer paladin. I get a lot of Sorkadon requests. And the truth is, odd as it may seem, I've never really done a serious Sorkadon build. I've, I've dabbled in it a little bit with like a single level dip or two but the truth is there's a lot of great synergy between sorcerers and paladins and so for what we're going to try and accomplish with this build the sorkadin is a perfect combo so i'm going all in on sorkadin today with maybe one very short detour along the way because there is one huge asterisk that comes attached to the paralyze tactic until you're level 11 at the earliest it really only works against humanoids for a lot of us um, that's right around the time that the campaign is going to end right i i see a lot of people try their hand at a sorkid and build with this tactic in mind and most of the time they sort of conveniently seem to forget about this very important issue about the, the humanoid thing. The, the result, I think, is some really strong burst damage against humanoids and some fairly mediocre Nova burst damage otherwise. So it's fantastic in a like humanoid heavy campaign, if you can find one of those, I don't know, maybe one of the water deep heist campaigns or something like that, but otherwise it's sort of hit and miss at best. So to try and remedy that, I'm gonna find a way to make the build do insanely good damage against humanoids, and then still really, really good Nova damage against everything else. To emphasize that point, against non-humanoids, this build that I'm about to go into is right up there with the best Nova damage builds that I've ever done to date. And against humanoids, if you can find them, it just, blows everything else away. Pun intended. And so, without any further ado, I present episode 54, The Critlander. And, oh, by the way, check out the artwork that my friend Randall Hampton did uh, for this particular build. Um, it's fantastic as always. Thanks, Randall. Make sure to check the video description for links to Randall's uh, social media pages so that you can follow him. All right. Let's jump into the build. Okay, at level one, for our class, I want to start as a paladin. I was actually, I was tempted to start with sorcerer because they get constitution saving throw proficiency and therefore concentration check proficiency. Uh, but the truth is that while we will be concentrating on spells often, uh, the risk of dropping concentration before we take advantage of the concentration spell that we'll be using primarily uh, is fairly low. As you'll see and paladins get heavy armor proficiency if you start off at level one as a paladin but not if you multi-class into them later and with the low dexterity that we're going to have uh, it felt more important to get heavy armor without having to take a feat for it so uh, we're starting paladin as for our race we're gonna go with mountain dwarf this is a first i am not planning on taking a single feat with this build not one i know it's crazy. There are definitely some feats that you could take and benefit from, but we'll get into it. I do, however, want a really high score in two 
abilities in particular. Uh, so we are going with the one race that gives us a plus two into ability scores, the Mountain Dwarf. As for those ability scores, again, assuming as always a point by system, I'm going to recommend that we start with a 15 strength and take a plus two there, and then a 15 charisma and take a plus two there using the rules from Tasha's that say you can take your plus two racials anywhere you want. And then I'd say start off with a 14 constitution. Paladins are mad. They are multiple ability score dependent. Uh, the only real way around this is to take a hexblade dip. I almost did. I was this close. But... Hmm. I'm sick of hexblades. <laughs> I, I still need a hiatus. And this is a Sorkadin, damn it, not a Sorlockadin. And actually, honestly, there were other reasons, statistically, uh, to not bother with the hexblade dip. As for equipment, um, pretty standard stuff. I'm going to recommend that the martial weapon you start with be a great sword or perhaps a maul. Those two are the, the hardest hitting non-magical weapons anyway in game. And then make sure you get chain mail, etc. And then at level one, as a paladin, you get divine sense, which lets you, you know, detect undead fiends, celestials up to 60 feet away. There's some potential utility there. And then you also get the lay on hands ability, of course, which is fantastic. It gives you points, five points per paladin level that you can use to heal one hit point each uh, as an action, or you can even cure uh, disease and poison when you use five of them, which can potentially be really nice and makes it so that regardless of how you play your character, you've got a pretty nice heal support option for you, which is one fantastic thing about Paladins. At level two, we get a fighting style. I'm gonna recommend that we take great weapon fighting style. It's not amazing for damage, but we're trying to build damage as much as we can, so let's go ahead and take this. It lets you re-roll ones and twos on the damage of your weapon when you roll your weapon damage, not on other things that you might be adding on top of the weapon when you make an attack, like Divine Smite, for example, but just for the weapon itself. So again, if we're using a greatsword 2d6, anytime you roll a one or a two on either of those, you can re-roll them. Typically, it's only a little more than like one point of damage uh, on average per turn. But if you are getting a critical hit, then it's twice as good, right? Because we are getting to roll double the dice. So for this particular build, I think it's actually a little bit better, at least during our Nova round, potentially, than it is on other builds. Still, if you wanted to go with a different fighting style, like defense or something like that, I wouldn't fault you. So yes, we do get Divine Smite. You know it. You love it. When you hit with a melee weapon attack, you use a spell slot to add 2d8 radiant damage to the target, plus 1d8 for every spell slot above first level that you expend for it, plus 1d8 if it's a fiend or an undead that you're attacking, right? It caps at a fourth level spell slot, 5d8, uh, or 68 for fiends and undead, I guess. And then, yes, of course, we do get spells at this level. The truth is, with a character who is going to be built for burst or nova damage, I'm going to be assuming that you're using most of your spell slots for smite. That may or may not be an intelligent thing to do, but that's just what I'm going to assume when I'm crunching numbers, right? So that said, outside of our big nova round of damage, our sustained damage is not going to be particularly amazing. So picking up a spell like bless, for example, which I definitely recommend, is kind of instantly going to make you a great party buffer because it's a very strong spell, letting you add a d4 for up to three people in your party, and you can upcast it to cover more, more of your party members. A d4 on all of their attacks and all of their saving throws as long as you maintain concentration. And I mean, since you're a paladin, you sort of are automatically pretty good at supporting allies anyway. So augmenting that with Bless just really makes you a, a pretty decent support character once your Nova round is, is all finished. And, and we're going to be leaning on that and kind of benefiting from that throughout our character's career, really. I would also recommend, for the same reason, picking up Cure Wounds, uh, which will just give you another additional way to heal in a pinch, you know, especially if you're out of Lay on Hands points. Definitely embrace the support aspect of your Sorkadin because it's quite strong without even trying very hard to make it so. At level three, we got Smite. 
So now we need to grab some sorcerer levels to really augment our Nova damage and allow us to paralyze. As a level one sorcerer, we get our subclass, our sorceress origin. And I love the divine soul subclass. And especially if I'm making a Sorkadon, it just, it feels like such a perfect fit thematically, right? Here's what we read about Divine Soul. Sometimes the spark of magic that fuels a sorcerer comes from a divine source that glimmers within the soul. Having such a blessed soul is a sign that your innate magic might come from a distant but powerful familial connection to a divine being. Perhaps your ancestor was an angel transformed into a mortal and sent to fight in a god's name, or your birth might align with an ancient prophecy, marking you as a servant of the gods or a chosen vessel of divine magic. Save your complex much? So, as your paladin was pursuing their oath, training, learning, they learned due to some portent or auspicious event uh, that they are in fact a divine soul and are thus infused with sorcerous magic. Maybe that explains why they were always so drawn to whatever deity they might have been religiously devoted to as a paladin, right? That's very exciting for you. So as a divine soul sorcerer at level one, we get divine magic. This basically gives us access to the full cleric spell list. That in and of itself makes this subclass incredibly powerful. It really helps us lean into the whole, when I'm not blowing things up, I'm supporting my allies thing that, that we've got going here. So you also get favored by the gods. This is an incredibly useful and powerful ability. It allows us once per short rest to roll 2d4 after we have failed an attack or a saving throw and add it to the total. 2d4 is a significant boost and the fact that we can wait until after we know that we failed to use it is really great. So we get spells, of course, as a sorcerer level one, we get some cantrips, we get some first level spells. The ones I'm going to focus on are first guidance um, that allows you to add a d4 to yourself or an ally on a skill check. It's fantastic utility. And then I want to recommend taking booming blade or green flame blade or both if you'd really prefer. This, of course, allows us to, you know, after fifth level anyway, as the cantrip scales, you cast the spell and as part of the spell, you make a weapon attack and then you do a bit of extra damage to the target plus some additional things, more damage if the target moves, if you used Booming Blade, damage to a nearby enemy if you're using Green Flame Blade. So we're going to be relying on, on one of those cantrips for damage early on in our career. For first level spells, I'd grab Healing Word so that you can heal from range as a bonus action, and then Sleep. Let's talk about sleep for just a second. Sleep is known as like an amazing control spell at low levels that becomes almost worthless later on. Let's, let's get into that a little bit. So this is how the spell works. This spell sends creatures into a magical slumber. You roll 5d8. The total is how many hit points of creatures this spell can affect. Creatures within 20 feet of a point you choose within range are affected in ascending order of their current hit points. Starting with a creature that has the lowest current hit points, each creature affected by the spell falls unconscious until the spell ends, the sleeper takes damage, or someone uses an action to shake or slap the sleeper awake. So 5d8 isn't a ton of potential hit points, right? On average, that's only about 23 hit points total that you have to spread amongst multiple enemies or potentially just one. The great thing about it though is that the creatures don't get to make a saving throw. So for lots of low level enemies, or even maybe like one sort of middling enemy at this level, it's really great control. The spell does scale, uh, letting you roll an additional 2d8 for every spell slot above first or about nine more hit points on average. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. At level four, you are a sorcerer two. Speaking of upcasting spells, we get second level spell slots now, thanks to our multi-classing with Paladin, right? Even though we don't have any second level spells, we could either smite harder or upcast sleep, for example, in order to get more enemies or one slightly healthier enemy uh, under our control. We also, as a sorcerer level two, get font of magic. We get our sorcery points, right? We get one sorcery point per level. Uh, they reset on a long rest and they will fuel our meta magic in a little bit. For now, we can just use them to create more spell slots for ourselves, which is nice. At level five, we're a sorcerer three and we get second level spells. There are tons of fantastic options. Pick your favorites, but the one that I'm going to focus on is old person. 
I'm sure many of you have predicted this by now. Whole person is either amazing or worthless. And it all depends on the creature type that you're fighting. As an action, you target one humanoid within 60 feet, and if they fail their wisdom save, they are paralyzed for one minute. They get to try to save again at the end of each of their turns. You can upcast the spell to affect one additional humanoid within 30 feet uh, for each level that you upcast it. So potentially quite a few enemies once you have higher level spell slots. Uh, this will actually be pretty important to remember, I think, later on. So what does paralyzed do? It means that they are incapacitated, they can't take actions or reactions, uh, they can't move, they can't speak, they automatically fail any strength or dexterity saving throws, attacks against them have advantage, all attacks, and yes, if their attacker is within five feet, any hits are automatically critical hits. And thus, Critlander. <laughs> now, of course, as we discussed at the beginning, you're not always going to be fighting humanoids. And therein is the big rub with this particular build, right? That said, a lot of enemies in D&D are actually humanoids, more than you might think. Uh, bullywugs, goblins, kuatoas, troglodytes, kobolds, gnolls, orcs, were creatures, uh, and many more are all humanoids, and thus the spell would work against them, not just, you know, your actual sort of elves and dwarves and assassins and mages and things like that that you'll find in the monster manual and other places. Of course, many, many more potential enemies are not considered humanoids. We, we do have a potential workaround uh, in those instances, however, and it is the sleep spell. So remember, sleep works against everything but undead. And attacks against unconscious creatures are also automatic critical hits if they're made within five feet of that unconscious creature. Unfortunately, of course, by level five, we're going to be a bit limited as to what creatures might actually be affected by sleep, but there will be times that you'll still be able to use it effectively, I think, depending on your table, depending on your campaign, but especially if you upcast the spell. So right now, you know, we only have second level spell slots, meaning we'd get around 31 hit points on average on our 78 roll to see how many, you know, hit points of creatures we can affect with it. We'd have a decent chance there of putting, say, like, a half ogre to sleep, some of the lower like dragon wormlings, a dire wolf, a giant spider, to name a few. So we could probably be crit lander against them. With third level spells, next level we'll be able to upcast it to get up to 40 hit points on average. But yeah, you know, generally uh, the hit points of enemies quickly outscales the spell's usefulness as the challenge rating of the enemies goes up. Still, at lower levels, it's a potential workaround. Also, as a sorcerer level 3, we do get metamagic, of course. We get to choose two metamagic options that let us fuel and empower all our spells in lots of cool ways. I love all of them. Um, I'm just going to say pick your favorite and then make sure you get Quicken Spell, because we're going to need that for the build. It lets us, for two sorcery points, of which we only have three right now, remember, you get one more per sorcerer level. Uh, it lets you cast a spell with a casting time of one action as a bonus action instead. And that's awesome. So also, just remember that at level 5, Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade will each do 1d8 damage on the initial hit. That's going to be important to remember also. At level six, we are a sorcerer level four, and we get our first ability score increase or feat. We've been sitting on a 17 for both strength and charisma thus far, and that has been really painful. Uh, so here I wanna take a plus one to each of them, right? So plus one to strength, plus one to charisma, giving us an 18 in our two most important ability scores, and that feels really good. Yes, we could have taken a Hexblade dip, like I say, and, and had we started with a custom lineage as our race and taken a free feat at level one that was like a half feat that gave us a one, you know, a, a bump of one to our charisma. By Sorcerer level four, we could have been at a 20 charisma and therefore had a 20 in both our attack and our spellcasting stat, which would have been really nice, but we would have been a level behind otherwise, which is important. 
We would have had restrictions on what kind of weapon that we could use as a Hexblade if we wanted our Charisma to be our attack stat until we got to Warlock level 3 at least, and that's just, that was just too much of an investment, and, and we would have just felt a little bit dirtier for taking a Hexblade dip. Sorry, Sere, forgive me. I love you. Actually, you know what? Um, speaking of, my friend Randall Hampton, check this out. He, he I commissioned him to do um, uh, an illustration of Ceridon, and uh, I absolutely love it. If you have not seen our uh, Tales of Anaria, please check that out here. But uh, anyway, give Randall some love. He's a fantastic artist, and uh, yeah, I love what he did with, with Sarah. Also, at this level, we do have third level spell slots in order to upcast our spells and our smites and things, right? Okay, so it's time for a damage report for our first damage report. First off, yes, I'm going to assume that we are fighting humanoids, but I will report on numbers otherwise too. So here's the plan. Round one, as a bonus action, we use Quicken Spell on Hold Person, letting us cast it as a bonus action. Then with our action, we would cast Booming Blade, and assuming that the creature we cast Hold Person on failed their saving throw, we get to attack with advantage. If we hit, we add a third level Smite, and because we automatically score a critical hit, we will do 4d6 from our greatsword, we will do 2d8 from Booming Blade, and we will do 8d8 from that smite, plus 4 for our strength score. So against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would do on average with that one attack, 65 damage. And against an enemy with a 15 armor class, uh, it would be 58 damage with that single attack. That is pretty good in the upper half, uh, I would say, when compared to other Nova damage builds that I've done. Make sure you check out the video description if you want to see the graphs and charts and comparisons to other builds and things. Now, some of you may be wondering, why would we even bother using Hold Person here if we could just quicken Booming Blade as a bonus action and then Booming Blade again as our action? Isn't two attacks just as good as or even better than one attack that gets a critical hit? The answer actually is not quite. You would do, in that scenario, 66 damage against an, an enemy with a 10 armor class and 49 damage against an enemy with a 15 armor class. So obviously this would actually be our tactic against a non-humanoid that we're not gonna cast hold person on, right? And it is a little less damage. There's a couple of things to consider here, right? First off, paralyzing an enemy, if you can do it, is fantastic for your entire party, right? Not just for you and your damage. Of course, you might kill the thing that you've paralyzed, but if you don't, the rest of your party will do extra damage to it because they'll have advantage on attacks and potential criticals if they're melee also. And maybe more importantly, that enemy that you've paralyzed isn't going to be able to hurt you and your friends until they break out of the spell. Also, Thanks to the advantage that we get against a paralyzed enemy, we actually do more damage to them on even middling armor classes and up uh, if we paralyze them first. Still, it's nice to know that if we're fighting non-humanoids, we're still putting out pretty solid. That gap is about to widen though. So let's talk about that. At this point in our career then, we are at a bit of a crossroads. Here are the questions that you're going to need to ask yourself. Do you want to be better at burst damage or do you want greater versatility, sustained damage, and the ability to burst damage more often? Do you want better burst damage or do you want your paralyzed to work on almost all enemies instead of just on humanoids? Also, what level is the campaign likely going to end at, right? So here's the thing. If you wanted to improve your sustained damage and your versatility and your survivability, I would say go back to Paladin here until you hit Paladin level six. If, on the other hand, you wanted to paralyze reliably against everything but undead, pro tip, don't play this build in the Curse of Strahd, then we're going to have to get to fifth level spells in order to get hold monster because hold monster will paralyze not just humanoids right it will paralyze everything but undead that is five levels away at the moment though and that is a huge investment of course along the way we'd pick up all kinds of great sorcerer and cleric spells features sorcery points etc but if your campaign is going to end at level 10 or level 11, you're not even going to be able to enjoy using it 
anyway. On the other hand, with just a teeny little three level dip into another class here, we can take our Nova round to supernova. At the cost of blowing through most of our expendable resources in one glorious explosion-y round of destruction. Hmm, I wonder what Colby will decide to do. So, at level 7, we are going fighter. <laughs> Naturally, I'm going all in on damage and everything else be damned. You knew this. I mean, the numbers that we are about to reach are fairly preposterous. And I just can't help myself when preposterous numbers are available. What can I say? Anyway, it looks like at this point in our character's career, their deity or the prophecy that they're trying to fulfill or the angel who first gave them their quest is encouraging them to further hone their martial skills for their trials that await them. So as a level one fighter, we get to pick a fighting style. I'm going to recommend that we take superior technique. This lets us use two maneuvers from the battle master maneuver uh, list and gives us one superiority die per short rest to spend to fuel one of those maneuvers. That superiority die is only a d6 as opposed to the d8 that battle masters typically get, but this will do wonders for our Nova round, especially against non-humanoids. I would make sure to take for one of your maneuvers trip attack which is going to let us add that d6 superiority die in damage if we hit with an attack uh, when we choose to use it, and then force the enemy that we've hit to make a strength saving throw if they are large or smaller, and if they fail it, they will be knocked prone. We also get second wind as a first level fighter, which um, you know lets us, as a bonus action, once per short rest, heal ourselves for 1d10 plus our fighter level. Uh, doesn't do a ton of healing for us here at level 7, but it might just be the difference between life and death, occasionally. At level 8, we are a fighter level 2, which means we get Action Surge, of course, which is one of, if not the best, abilities to take if you're building a character for Nova damage or, or burst damage. This allows us to, once per short rest, just on one of our turns, get a whole nother action. And you can use that action to do whatever having another action allows you to do. At level 9, we are a Fighter 3, and we get our Martial Archetype, our subclass, and I'm going to recommend that we take the Echo Knight. Another first, and it only took me a year of people asking. <laughs> so, Echo Knight comes to us from uh, Matt Mercer's Wild Amount. Book, right along with the chronurgist wizard the graviturgist wizard it might not necessarily be considered like core DD &D material but it is official content echo knight is probably the most oft requested subclass from my viewers that i do a build on that that i haven't yet done and i'm only going to take a dip for this particular build but I promise to do a little more thorough build using more Echo Knight levels later, so be patient if you would, thank you. But anyway, here's what we read about the Echo Knight. A mysterious and feared frontline warrior of the Kryn dynasty, the Echo Knight has mastered the art of using Dunamis, I don't know if I'm even pronouncing that right, to summon the fading shades of unrealized timelines to aid them in battle. Hey Dallin, how do you say Dunamis? I don't know. It's, it's one you're, of the Mercer things. You're a bigger Critical Role fan than I am. Yeah, let me see. Where is it? Not right there. Oh, Dunamis. Dunamis. Like Dunamancy. Dunamis. All right. Thanks, Mr. Rogers. Yeah. I'm not going to edit that out, by the way. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Surrounded by echoes of their own might, they charge into the fray as a cycling swarm of shadows and strikes. So, okay, your deity or angelic guardian has bestowed an incredibly powerful magical boon upon you and we're going to use it to great effect. Now, just in case your DM doesn't allow stuff from the Wild Amount book, I think I'd probably go with Battlemaster here because that would also be really great for our burst round. Or alternatively, actually, you could just get a head start on more paladin levels um, like we're about to do next level. As a level three Echo Knight, we get Manifest Echo. As a bonus action, you can magically manifest an echo of yourself within 15 feet. It's magical, it's translucent, it lasts until it's destroyed, or moves more than 30 feet away from you, or you're incapacitated, or you dismiss it. 
<laughs> it has an armor class of 14 plus your proficiency bonus, which is an 18 right now, and that's not terrible. I mean, that's that's what we're at if we have uh, plate mail armor that's not magical anyway. Um, it only has one hit point, so it is still fairly fragile. But on your turn, you can command it to move 30 feet, no action required by you, and you can do cool things like swap places with it or attack from their space or your space at your choosing or take an attack of opportunity against someone that leaves its space. There's no limit on how often you can summon it so far as I can tell, which is great. It just requires a bonus action. So even though it's fragile, you can just bring it back. Lots of great flavor and fun utility with your echo. The most important thing about it for us, of course, is that we get the unleash incarnation feature, which tells us that whenever we take the attack action, we can make an additional attack from the Echo's position. It's based on our constitution bonus, right? The number of times we can do this per day, right? So only two times per day, uh, unfortunately. But um, during our Nova round, this is going to give us a couple extra attacks, which is really, really strong. So damage report for level nine, things have changed drastically for us in the last three levels for our Nova round. We're no longer using Booming Blade. Instead, assuming that we're fighting a humanoid, we are using Quicken Spell to hold person, then if the enemy fails their save, taking the attack action to attack with our greatsword or maul and smite at the third level. Then because we took the attack action, we will use Unleash Incarnation, which lets us make an additional attack, which we will also add a smite at the third level too. Then we're gonna Action Surge and do it all over again. Smiting at the second level on those next two attacks uh, since we're out of third level spell slots. We're also going to be adding our 1d6 for our superiority die to the first attack that lands, which will make it a 2d6, right? Because it's a critical hit. That's four attacks and four smites, all made with advantage that automatically crit if they land for a total of 18d6 plus 28d8 for our smites, plus 16 for our strength score on, on four attacks. Against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would do on average 215 damage. And against an enemy with a 16 armor class, we would do 190. <laughs> what the crap? 200 and what at ninth level, right? Now, you might be saying to yourself, that's overkill. What enemy is going to have 200 hit points at this level? That's a very good question. Uh, most would not, especially if they're humanoids. So in that case, you know, cast hold person as a third level spell so you can paralyze two enemies and then go do 100 damage to each of them. Okay, fine, against a non-humanoid. Instead of quickening hold person, you would quicken booming blade. Uh, as your bonus action giving you a fifth attack that also adds an extra d8 to it thanks to booming blade you'd use trip attack on your first attack ideally and if they fail they will be prone um, and so you'll still have advantage for the rest of that turn um, you're no longer automatically getting a critical hit of course right but you are going to be making five attacks uh, total with the booming blade bonus action adding a smite to each one and it will still be 157 damage at 10 armor class and 140 at 16 armor class. And that's still higher than any other Nova build that I've done to date at this level, except the Evoker Wizard. And they were doing total damage to three targets, right? Now, the biggest downside, of course, to all of this is you have just burned through five spell slots, your action surge, most of your meta magic points, both of your Unleash Incarnation charges, and your one superiority die. The only damage-based resources that you have left potentially are three first-level spell slots. <laughs> but man, what a rush. Totally worth it. Oh, and those leftover first-level spell slots, by the way, don't, do not smite with them. Use Bless and Lay on Hands and let someone else take the spotlight, you glory hog. Lighting change. <laughs> All right, at level 10, um, sticking with fighter would be a little quicker route to extra attack by one level. But I wanted to make a Sorkadin, so dang it, I'm making a Sorkadin. And the truth is there is a lot that we would pick up by going back to Paladin here. So we are going to be a Paladin 3 at level 10. First of all, we get our subclass, our Sacred Oath. 
And I think of all of the available options, my favorite for this build would be uh, the Oath of Devotion, which is actually another first uh, for me. So it's, a, it's just a day of firsts. It felt really great with Divine Soul thematically, I think, for this character. I mean, this character is just really into their religion, I think. They might be that quintessential, like, religious zealot. But that doesn't have to be, by the way, like that crazy, evil zealot, the bishop from Castlevania type character, right? It could be uh, Joan of Arc or Sturm Brightblade. Dragonlance, anyone? Here's what we read about the Oath of Devotion Paladin. They hold angels, the perfect servants of good, as their ideals and incorporate images of angelic wings into their helmets or coats of arms. Again, I think that's perfect with a divine soul, and it really would make me want to like have an angel be part of my story, I think, for this character. But anyway, that said, I'm not strictly married to this oath. Like, if there's another one that you feel strongly about, I'd say go for it. My runner-up would probably be a conquest paladin for the plus 10 to hit channel divinity on one attack. The area of fear, though, is really nice too. But anyway, we're gonna go Oath of Devotion. So first of all, you get at level three a couple of channel divinity options. All paladins and clerics for that matter get a channel divinity that they can use once per short rest to do a couple of cool things. And for us, those things are Sacred Weapon, which is my favorite of the channel divinity options for this character and the one that really kind of pushed me this direction. So it allows you to, as an action, give a bonus to hit to your weapon attacks based on your charisma modifier, which is a plus four for us right now, for one minute. So for one minute, you would have a plus four to all of your weapon attacks. And that is really, really strong. The only downside, and it's a big one, is that it takes an action to activate. So in reality, I probably only use this channel divinity, you know, in those instances where you can maybe prepare for a fight beforehand, or you know it's going to be a really long fight, so that a buff like this would be worth it over time. If we are blowing most of our resources in one big Nova round, it's going to be really important that every single one of our attacks hit. And even if we're going to have advantage on those attacks, the enemy might still have a decent armor class. And a plus four to hit is just really going to help us make sure that every single hit lands and that our Nova damage round is as effective as possible. The other channel divinity option that we get as a devotion paladin is turn the unholy. It's basically turn undead, but it works on fiends too, which is really nice. So you can kind of force undead and fiends now to make a saving throw. And if they fail it, they have to spend their turn running away from you. In certain combats, this will be really incredible. And otherwise, it won't really do much for you. And so don't forget that thanks to Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, we now have a third option. Every paladin has a third option for their channel divinity, which is Harness Divine Power. And it lets you essentially spend your channel divinity to recover a spell slot. It costs a bonus action. You can recover one spell slot that's equal to half of your proficiency bonus rounded up. So that would be a second level spell slot for us right now, which is really nice actually. And, and it might end up being the thing that you use your channel divinity for as often as anything else. At level 11, we are a Paladin 4 and we get another ability score increase or feat. And I will admit that initially when considering this, I was really, really torn on what to take. So up until this point in our character's career, having the Great Weapon Master feat wasn't all that important for us, surprisingly, because we're getting so many dice on our Nova round and making so many attacks that when you looked at the numbers, the, the plus 10 to damage we get from Great Weapon Master at the cost of a minus five to hit, made it so that turning the feet on and actually using it, right, was really only worth it at really low enemy armor classes. Like I've been saying, you know, getting a hit when, especially when your target's paralyzed, but, but just in general on that Nova round when you're expending so many resources, it was just way more important than really anything else. However, we now have Sacred Weapon, potentially, right? Which almost completely negates that minus five to hit penalty that Great Weapon Master puts on us. So, so we should get Great Weapon Master now, right? The problem is, again, Sacred Weapon, it's only once per short rest, so you can't rely on it every single fight. It costs an action to use. And the crazy thing is that when you crunch the numbers, and I have, even if we had Sacred Weapon activated, 
we would turn off Great Weapon Master at about a 17 armor class right now against non-humanoids even, which isn't that high really for enemies at this level, right? It's just, it is, it's just that important that we hit during our Nova round, meaning that we would be better off damage-wise just bumping our strength here instead of picking up the Great Weapon Master feat when we're facing an enemy of the 17 armor class or higher. And of course, outside of our Nova round, I don't know that we're necessarily going to have advantage reliably against our enemies. And so then we definitely wouldn't be using Great Weapon Master most of the time. Add to that the fact that I just really want to get my strength up to 20, my charisma up to 20 as well, to say nothing of constitution, which would be really nice. I'm going to go ahead and recommend that we just bump strength here. We cap it at 20. Bumping charisma actually would also be a really great idea. Um, you should totally do that if you want to lean into like your spell and support features, if you want your your hold person to stick more reliably, etc. At level 12, we are Paladin 5, and we finally get extra attack, assuming we're even playing the game still. <laughs> we waited a long time for this, I know. And many of you are going to say too long. I don't feel bad about it. Action Surge coupled with Unleash Incarnation actually got us two more attacks on our Nova round than just having extra attack would have done. And when you're smiting every single hit, two more attacks in a turn is a big deal. Of course, without extra attack, we've been doing less damage in between our Nova rounds. But like I've said, I'm personally okay with that. I mean, the idea for the character, for me anyway, was Nova round and then move into a support role. The truth is, Picking up extra attack sooner so that we could do another 2d6 from our weapon plus 4 or maybe 5 damage each turn just really I don't think would make a huge difference in fights at this point, especially without a reliable source of advantage on our attacks. I just say like go big, go Nova, and then go support. But now that we have our bigger, better Nova round with those three levels of fighter, extra attack is much better because Again, with Action Surge now, we'll get two more attacks during our Nova round, thanks to extra attack. We attack once, then we get extra attack, then we use Unleash Incarnation, and then we Action Surge, and we do it all again, right? So now we're getting six attacks on our Nova round, which is fantastic. We also, of course, get second level Paladin spells. I would just say pick your favorites. There's none that I'm really gonna highlight. If you don't have them uh, from the Cleric spell list yet, Go ahead and pick up, you know, your aid, your lesser restoration, things like that. Of course, you've got to get fine steed because you're a paladin, right? Um, Zone of truth is fantastic when you need it, but anyway, pick your favorites. At level 13, we are a paladin 6, which means we get aura of protection. One of the best defensive abilities for you and your friends that exists in the game, as far as I'm concerned. And I really regret delaying it this long. Uh, a better teammate would have gone paladin 6 sooner. <laughs> but... Now, you and your allies within 10 feet all get a bonus to all of your saving throws equal to your charisma bonus. Another good argument for increasing your charisma modifier, right? Uh, last level, but that's just amazing and I really have nothing else to say about it. We also do now have one fourth level spell slot that we could use to hit our 5d8 smite cap if we want. Oh, we want. So. For our damage report at level 13, we are now making six attacks during our Nova round, thanks to extra attack, unleash incarnation, and action surge. Each attack does 2d6 plus five. I'm assuming you'll, you have sacred weapon on. You might not. We'll be assuming one 5d8 smite, three 4d8 smites, and two 3d8 smites for those six attacks, plus a 1d6 for our superiority die. If we quick and hold person on a humanoid and they fail their save, we'll be doing 26d6 plus 46d8 plus 30. And on an enemy with a 10 armor class, it would be 339 damage. And against an enemy with a 17 armor class, it would be 334 damage, almost the same. All right, without sacred weapon on, it's no difference at low armor class, it's about a 25 point difference at kind of the mid to high armor classes. And then of course against non-humanoids that you are not holding and you're not auto-critting, but you are now getting 7 attacks thanks to Quick and Booming Blade, which by the way does 2d8 on, an, on a hit now. And assuming advantage again, of course, thanks to Trip Attack, 
it's still 245 damage at a 10 armor class and 242 damage at a 17 armor class, and that is still stupid. All right, at level 14, I think it's time to go back to Sorcerer. Seriously? Aura of Devotion is right there, you freaking damage slut. I know, but I really want to get more spell slots for more smites. Immunity to charm for you and all of your friends, dude. I know, but 5d8 on a smite means 10d8 on a crit. <sighs> right, so if you really wanted to be a team player, go ahead and go Paladin 7 here for uh, for the Devotion Aura, which uh, is awesome and it's going to give you immunity to charm and your friends too if they're within 10 feet. We are getting six attacks on our Nova round now and I want to fill those up with the best smite that I can possibly fill them up with. So we're going back to Sorcerer. You get, of course, here, third level Sorcerer and Cleric spells. All the usual suspects here for Clerics and Sorcerers. None that are going to significantly improve our Nova round, I don't think. So pick your favorites, you know, Counterspell, Dispel Magic, Fireball, Revivify, uh, Catnap. I think there is a solid argument to be made for taking Spirit Shroud here and like Quickening Spirit Shroud maybe as a bonus action, especially against non-humanoids. Um, instead of Quickening Booming Blade. It's a little less damage overall for your burst round, but then of course it would add a 1d8 to all of your attacks every round thereafter as long as you maintain concentration. And now that we have extra attack, especially I think it's definitely worth considering. At level 15, we would be a Sorcerer 6, and that means we get, as a Divine Soul Sorcerer, um, the Empowered Healing ability because we're totally using our first level spell slots for healing because that's all we have left. Anytime you or an ally within f five feet uh, roll dice to determine how much that you or they heal from a spell, you can spend one sorcery point to re-roll any number of them. It's not the worst thing. It can be a nice little buff to healing that you or frankly another ally do. It's not amazing, but again, you know, if we're going to kind of lean into that support role, it can be a nice way to buff uh, heals and, and that's, that's always welcome. Don't forget, however, that we could be using those sorcery points if we wanted to create more spell slots for ourselves, which we're probably gonna wanna do once in a while, I would think. Speaking of, we now have a fifth level spell slot. If we wanted to use that for smite, we could. Uh, it wouldn't do any more damage. It would still be capped at a 5d8, but it's available. At level 16, you are a sorcerer seven and you get fourth level cleric and sorcerer spells. Same as before, pick your favorite. Um, there's great ones, Dimension Door, Greater Invisibility, Polymorph, Wall of Fire, have fun with it. At level 17, you are a Sorcerer 8, and we get our final, for this character, Ability Score Increase or Feat. I'm gonna say that we should bump Charisma here and take it to the cap to 20. Arguably should have done this a while ago. Uh, maybe taking Fighter 4 at some point along the path would be probably the quickest way to get there. And that would just make sure that your whole person sticks, make sure that you know, your saving throws are all buffed more, make sure that we heal more, etc, etc. We also do now have a 6 level spell slot, which means that if we were to be so foolish, <laughs> we could get a 5d8 smite on all 6 of our attacks during our Nova round. Should we see what that looks like? Let's do it. Uh, oh, and also, for what it's worth, uh, next level, which I'm not going to get into, we do finally get Hold Monster, so that we could potentially paralyze all creatures but undead. Finally. Okay, so damage report level 17 on the off chance that we're fighting a humanoid at this level or multiple that we'd want to upcast hold person for who all failed their hold person saves and didn't have any legendary resistances for that matter with our six auto crit attacks uh, with six 5d8 smites on each we would do 26d6 plus 60d8 plus 30. Assuming we have sacred weapon turned on Against a 10 armor class, we would do 406 damage. And against an 18 armor class, we would do 406 damage. <laughs> yep, it's the same 
at a 10 armor class as it is for 18. With Sacred Weapon, a maxed strength, and a maxed charisma, we are a plus 16 to hit, so you only miss if you get a natural one. Of course, the likelihood of fighting humanoids at this level that don't have legendary saves especially is really slim. So against everyone else who you're not paralyzing, you would be doing a measly 284 damage at 10 armor class and 284 damage at 18 armor class. So yeah, you're gonna one-shot an adult red dragon. So, final thoughts. I kind of have a lot to say here. If this is like the first of my videos that you've seen, you might be surprised at the way that I kind of assume best case scenario when I'm crunching numbers for damage, right? It's really, it's something that I kind of always do just to show what's possible with a build, even if it's not necessarily probable. Of course, with this one, um, even the probable is still pretty impressive damage-wise. Now, of course, you might decide to just skip those fighter levels, right? And either go back to Paladin until you hit level six so that you can pick up extra attack, or start, you know, keep focusing on Sorcerer so that you can get up to fifth level spells and use Hold Monster and now more reliably hold your enemies and therefore paralyze them. The result either way is going to be a Nova round that is much more subdued, even against non-humanoids by comparison. Still, there would be good reasons to do so. Um, potentially getting extra attack sooner and or potentially getting to hold monster sooner along with, you know, more spells, more spell slots, better, higher level spells, more sorcery points. You'd be more well-rounded. You would do better sustained damage outside of your Nova round, at least if you went for extra attack sooner. Not to mention you'd be a better support character with better survivability probably, but hey, most of you guys know me by now. Stretching things way beyond what's reasonable is kind of my MO. You be reasonable. <laughs> Adjust this build as you see fit. Also, thank goodness I hadn't done this build yet before everyone chose their character for the, uh, for the upcoming 20k PvP teamfight, because most players are humanoids, right? And so this would be really effective in that scenario, and it would be devastating. And it's like, whoever got this character would probably win almost single-handedly. Actually, now that I think about it, maybe this level of damage uh, against humanoids isn't super reliable, but it could be for your big bad in your campaign, if you're a dungeon master. <laughs> I mean, again, most player characters are humanoids. You know, your big bad casts hold person as a third level spell and paralyzes the entire party potentially, and then proceeds to get six auto crits on... <laughs> the party and basically TPKs everybody. Yeah, players don't let your dungeon master watch this video and um, If they did you have my sincere apologies. Also, I, I really really do like how this character can potentially double as like a decent support character the, the truth is with six levels of Paladin anyway and like the bless spell you can do a lot for your team once your burst round is over some of you have probably noticed I've kind of developed a fondness for characters that can fill like both support and damage roles, right? Um, I mean, there's Mercy Monk, there's the Spore Beast, there's the Undead Warlock. I don't know how many cards I have left, so maybe I'll try and put some of those up there. Links. I can absolutely see like saving some of your best bursty resources and spreading your Nova damage out a little bit more instead of just going like all in on one single enemy for one round. I mean, and let's be honest, a lot of the time the burst damage that that this character is capable of would be kind of overkill anyway. So why not spread it out? So maybe, you know, you get some solid Nova damage once per fight, um, and you can spread it out over a few fights a day and, and then still provide some okay damage and some decent support in between to kind of, to keep the character feeling sort of fresh and I guess giving you some diversity to your gameplay and how you play turn to turn and round to round. Um, I think it would make for a very fun and versatile character to play in game and really powerful That's the build for the week. Um, so thank you for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed it I had a lot of fun with it and uh, I love you guys and I think that you're all fantastic So please do all of the things the you know liking and subscribing and turning on notifications and joining the channel and stuff and I hope to talk to you again really soon in the meantime. Have a fantastic day. Take care